All right, everyone, we're going to get started. You have two options. One is to come take your seat, or the other is to not take your seat and hear more j bad jokes from me. I'm sure you all heard the one about what lies at the bottom of the ocean and shakes. A nervous wreck. <laughs> All right, Jennifer Jenks is going to uh, kick off, actually she's going to close out the first session and, ki and kick off the next session, um, and we still only have an hour for lunch, so we're going to move things along fairly quickly. Thank Jennifer, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, fantastic. So yes, as Tim said, I'm going to wrap up the session before and then kick off this next one um, as well. So my name is Jennifer Jenks. I've spoken to a lot of you over the last uh, day and a half. I am currently the director of the IHO's Data Center for Digital Bathymetry that um, is co-hosted by NOAA. And I also serve as the current chair for the IHO's Crowdsource Bathymetry Working Group, and it's in that capacity that I'm here speaking to all of you today. So I have to admit, I was a little intimidated <laughs> as I was listening to Gary and Norma. I was like, oh my God, these are, this is a lot to try to follow. But then I realized they actually set the stage absolutely perfectly. Still a little intimidated. But Gary did a great job of, you know, one of the many takeaways from his talk was just a reminder that, you know, we have this major problem. We, we have the big elephant in the room, and there really isn't a one-size-fits-all solution, and that we really need to figure out together how to overcome um, this unmapped ocean. And then, of course, Norma gave a super inspirational talk, just reminding us, you know, and this is just one community, but the type of impact that a single community can truly make in achieving our goals. I feel like it's sort of against the law to give any sort of presentation about mapping the ocean floor without yet another hit over the head that reminds us of how much work we still have ahead of us. And when we start really digging in and we go to our workshops and we go to our conferences, it's a lot about the technology, the current solutions that are out there to try and make, try and reach that 100% mapped ocean floor. And so it's typically governments, industry, um, 
academic institutions that are that are talking about the advancements that are being made in these technologies and their communities and how they are coming together to collaborate and again to try and progress our goals. But the fact is, and we do all know this, it's still going to take more. It is still going to take a true global effort of everyone coming together to really get to that 100%. And hey, I would be super happy if one day we really are told, you know what, everything's mapped. We really don't need any additional help. Thank you very much. You can all go home. But we are a long way from that. And so how are we going to do that? It really is going to take everyone. It's going to take the crowd. And so when I started thinking, you know, okay, well, what, what is that crowd? What does it really look like? And I realized I need to do some real serious um, research to prepare for this talk. I went to where we all go today, and I went to Google, and I just threw it in there, you know. What are we talking about when we're talking about the crowd and, and the potential that's out there? And of course, the answers got more and more um, colorful as I, as I scroll down, but at the top of the results was basically the takeaways. There's a lot of boats that are out on the water at any given day, anywhere from a lot of boats to a whole heck of a lot of boats, all shapes and sizes. And then as you start going down the rabbit hole, as one tends to do when they're Googling, then you start looking at, okay, maybe not even boats that are on the water, but registered vessels. And so in the US alone, this blew me away, you know, almost 12 million boats that are out there. So again, you just start thinking, the potential is here, the boats are here. And then you start thinking, and it was referred to a few times yesterday with Steve and with others in the audience, that this concept of what we're calling now crowdsource bathymetry in the past was called passage sounding. It, it's not anything new. Volunt taking advantage of volunteers out on the water and asking to report out on their observations, this isn't a new idea. We can even go back to our lovely clergyman, Magnus here, in the 1500s. He certainly wasn't getting out on a boat to go and observe those monsters himself. He was building his beautiful maps based on the stories and the observations over several years, getting all of those stories from many, many others. Along with the observations of our monsters were, of course, observations of depths, because since the beginning, there's, it was never a question that that information was equally as important. Of course, methodology on obtaining that data didn't change for thousands of years, but it quickly grew in importance. And I stole this title from Jamie from a presentation years ago, and it really did become a portrayal as a necessity as these maps continued to spread throughout the world. Of course, now here we are in the early 1900s and we have JEPCO, we have this idea that we really need to be having these global maps to fit a variety of purposes. And at this time, the main contributor to these maps were, of course, those passage soundings. And it was really only in the last several decades that JEPCO was able to really start counting on these systematic surveys to now finally come to the table and start to really make a solid contribution. But in 2014, the IHO returned to the conversation, leading the conversation, and again, this also predates CBET 2030, vocally recognizing again that yes, the systematic surveys are not just important, they're leading the way, but again, alone isn't going to get the job done. And so they formally stepped forward and said, we really do need to have a concentrated effort that will help to encourage all mariners who are interested to not only collect, but also contribute depth, depth observations that they're already looking at on their vessels. And so I don't think I need to repeat the very formal definition of CSB. Steve Keating did a good job going into this yesterday. But again, we are looking at depth measurements from vessels, just using their standard navigation instruments. 
And so we can look at, then this is just a screenshot from the data viewer hosted by the IHO DCDB. And this is showing where we are today with crowdsource bathymetry data that's actually being made publicly discoverable and accessible. And for me, there are two takeaways here. One is the obvious one, it ain't that much. But on the other side of the coin is in certain parts of the world, it actually is quite a bit of data and it's data that's growing every day. And these are data that are currently being contributed by only around 250, uh, 275 vessels. So we do have super yachts, we do have cruise ships, we have some from the oil and gas industry, but mostly recreational boaters. But if we kind of go in a little bit and start looking at some of the regional efforts that are taking place, and we're going to uh, go into a lot more detail on some of these in a minute, but that is today where we really are seeing the impact playing out. And so one of the, the best um, projects out there that we like to highlight all the time is the work being done along the Great Barrier Reef by Dr. Rob Beeman, who several years ago also came to the same conclusion that systematic surveys are already not getting the job done and are likely not going to anytime soon and put out this quote that it was nearly 40% of the reef that isn't mapped. And in some remote areas, there's no depth of data at all. And that just, that blew my mind. And so these are two um, images that I just uh, borrowed from Rob just last week. So these are hot off the press from just a few months ago that are really showing the impact, the white track lines that you see in both of those images of the amount of data that can be contributed. And this is just from 10 ships, 10 boats actually, small vessels with just very inexpensive data loggers. There's a whole lot of words here, but I think for those that are interested, I think that this is just an extremely cool story. And this is one that Dr. Brian Calder and I are just now starting to get more involved with. And I included this because I think this is a very extreme outside the box way of thinking about how this routine operations that are taking place all around the world can really play a role in contributing data. And so this is in, in the US, in Virginia, where you had a governor of a state go to a local university and say, hey, we have money and we really need to get a lot of commercial fishers out there to come and remove all of these old unused crab traps in the Chesapeake Bay. Great, handed out 70 imaging sonar units whose main purpose was just to go and tag where these traps were located. Oh, by the way, in the meantime, they were also taking depth readings. So four years later, over 50 million depth data points recorded. We're now working on processing all of this data, and this is obviously going to stand to make an extremely important contribution to this one area. which brings us back to the whole world. And it just makes you think, okay, if, if these sorts of regional projects can be repeated again and again and again, and bigger vessels are getting better and better echo sounders and they're able to reach deeper and deeper depths, can we really scale this out to put ourselves in a position to make a real contribution to the CBET 2030, to the JEPCO effort? And it's interesting, and this is a colleague who used to be quite active in our crowdsource bathymetry working group, but has since moved on. But I don't let a presentation go by without stealing this quote, because he crunched the numbers. And if we really could get just 1%, just a single percent of all seagoing vessels that are logging data, we kind of figure that they're spending half their time at sea, we're looking at a heck of a lot of points, potentially 5 billion data points a day. And again, who are we to turn down any of that data when we only have 25% of our ocean floor mapped? So the need is there. There's no one in this room that's gonna argue that. Google tells me that the boats are there. So what is standing in our way from truly being able to scale this from these amazing little regional projects to a global effort? 
So national policy, not a surprise. This has been a reoccurring theme in a lot of talks yesterday and this morning. Barriers, obviously, with technology. And public perception. I don't think I need to convince any of you, but we do know that there are quite a few in our communities that do need convincing. So I don't need to go into too much here, and Tim will be thankful since we're running behind. Most countries, it really isn't that they have said no to sharing crowdsourced bathymetric data. It's that they just won't give a public, a, an official position on the topic. And so we have to treat that as a no. There have only been 34 coastal states that have formally come forward and said that they are open to the sharing of these data. And so at least for the data that resides in our database, this is what that looks like. This is the, the filter that we apply to all of the data that comes in, rejecting all data from no countries or again, all of those 70 countries, 60 countries or so that haven't said anything at all. Everything that you see in yellow are countries that have said yes, but, and we have to figure out how to respond to their, to their caveats. And so this is a very significant amount of data that's just sitting there. All of these data are being collected all over the world, we all know this, but data that are unable to be used. And then the technology. It has to be easy if we really are expecting, hoping, dreaming one day to go out there and ask hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of mariners, please collect and contribute data. They need to be able to press a button to collect that data, to offload their data and get it to the public. Of course, it isn't just about the collection and contribution. It's also about, okay, great, the data's out there. We wanna incentivize people to collect more. Most people, all they want in return is that data themselves. It's hard to access, and then if they do get it, it's hard to use. So can we make this data usable? Can we make products out of these data that the public want? And then perception. A lot of my colleagues that are gonna speak to you today are gonna talk about you know, going and talking to the communities and getting so much different types of pushback. Not every fisher out there is super excited at the idea or what they perceive as, you know, is everyone now going to know where my special fishing hole is? Or a super yacht owner is not too keen and fears having his or her location known. So these are things that we also have to keep in mind and have to be put in build ourselves up to be able to respond to. But at the same time, all of these obstacles, we can overcome them. I don't have the answers. I don't know how to get the, the remaining 60 plus coastal states on board. But I mean, this is still something we can still move forward and try to achieve. And of course, in fact, we've started to overcome these obstacles. And that's what the agenda, this is what was kept in mind when we were putting together this agenda. And so the speakers for the rest of the day are going to be tackling a lot of what I talked about with different points of view, but are gonna to present to all of you the, the advancements that are being made, the concerns that they have, how they plan to continue to progress. And then when we're done, I hope you're all gonna be so inspired and so excited, and you're gonna think, you know what, I would really like to join a group of people and continue these conversations, be a part of the conversations, bring your concerns, bring your ideas, and consider joining the IHO's working group on crowd, crowdsourced bathymetry. Because again, it's a major problem. It's a bit of an overwhelming problem. We all know this, but if we, this is one that as a global community, we really can all come together and play a very large role in finding the solution. So thank you. And now as your moderator, are there any questions? Yes, Gary. I was talking to a colleague of mine uh, about a, six months or so ago about the very challenge you have about the number of vessels and, and getting the data points you need. Uh, he's a leading expert in the industry with ECDIS, you know, electronic chart display systems, et cetera. Um, and he says it would be a very simple 
thing to do to add a, a, a hardware amend and a piece of software to your ECDIS system that would automatically download, offload your position, depth and time as you just continued along your transit. And obviously under IMO, vessels are a certain size, have to have ECDIS systems, so on and so forth. Would that be another avenue of approach or methodology? Would you have to go through the ECDIS manufacturers or does it have to go as high as IMO to try and make that sort of approach? Or is it not worthwhile at all? Oh, it's definitely not worth your last comment there. Um, and as far as the IMO, I'm not in a position to speak to that. But as far as technology goes, it's absolutely another route, another possibility that, that should be looked into. And that's one of the exciting things that with our working group is we have quite a bit of industry that are very active, that are, that are coming and being a part of these conversations and, and offering solutions. And that, that's actually why we're going to have a, a session dedicated to just four examples of the work that's, that's being done. But that is another avenue um, that should continue to be um, followed. So if I can get a contact from you after this, that would be great. Thank you, Gary. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and move on because I know everyone's going to be hungry here. Oh, no. Can you hand me my laptop, please? So if I can please have um, the panelists for this upcoming um, session, just go ahead and come and, and join me up here. Okay, and if I, there we go. Okay, so the, the first session of, of first panel discussion for today is citizen science around the world. So we're gonna take the next 45 minutes and really dive in um, to, a, to just a couple of example programs um, that, have, that are at different levels of maturity um, and, and have a chance to have um, these four folks here just give an overview of these programs and then allow for a bit of panel discussion, throw out a question or two, but mostly I'm hoping that, that you all um, will, will, will be able to and be inspired to, to find out more information. And so I'll just do a very high level bio and then I'll, we'll just go in the order. Very nice, everyone's seated accordingly, fantastic. So I am gonna start here. Um, with Katie Sheehan. Norma uh, introduced her a little while ago, but she is the Citizen Science Data Manager for International Seakeepers Society, and she facilitates the Seakeepers Seabed 2030 project and the Neusta Net Research Collective. Katie has implemented the new, or implements the new Citizen Science projects at Seakeepers by connecting the marine science community with active vessels to collect marine samples around the world. And then we have Tim, who you all know, but Tim Kearns is a technology executive with a foundation in ocean data and software and hardware, leadership, product development, team growth, and business strategy. He currently serves as the chief information officer for the Great Lakes Observing System, which is a bi-national nonprofit that provides end-to-end -end data services that support science policy management and industry in both the US and Canada. Sarah Grasty has been an outreach and informal educator in marine science over the last 10 years, and she currently manages the Center for Ocean Mapping and Innovative Technologies Education and Outreach Efforts, and serves as the lead for Comet's CSB pilot program known as Crowd the Bay. And finally, Mr. Sam Harper is the IHO Assistant Director for Survey and Operations. And as part of his portfolio, he is the Permanent Secretary to JEPCO and is the IHO Representative to the Hydrographic Surveys Working Group and is the Secretary for our Crowdsource Bathymetry Working Group. Prior to joining the IHO Secretariat, he was the head of the hydrographic programs at the UKHO and has worked with over 25 nations globally to help build their national hydrographic infrastructure. And with that, I would like to first have Katie meet me up here on the podium to discuss the Seakeepers 
International Sea Keepers Program. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Um, all right, good afternoon, everybody. I am very happy to be here and speak to you a little bit about Sea Keepers and about our Citizen Science Department and some of the work that we're doing with Seabed 2030. So as Norma kind of gave this wonderful overview of Sea Keepers, we were established 25 years ago by members of the yachting community. And we have since expanded to kind of include the boating community at large. So we do like to offer opportunities to everybody, no matter the size of the vessel or where you travel around the world. Um, and we have four programs within the International Seakeeper Society, consisting of scientist-led expeditions, citizen science, education, and community engagement. So, let's see. Here we go. Okay, so one of the projects within our citizen science department is our collaboration with Seabed 2030. So you all saw in that lovely video with Maiden Factor, our international relations manager, Jill Go Rodriguez, and she began our partnership with Seabed 2030 after seeing them present at COP26 in late 2021. And then I was brought on to the Seakeepers team and began managing the project in 2022. And as of this fall, we have established ourselves as a trusted node within the IHO. Um, but everything that we do within this citizen science program is in fulfillment of Seabed 2030's mission of mapping the entire ocean floor by the year 2030. So we have installed loggers on 75 boats around the world. These consist of super yachts, tenders, like we mentioned, that are really great at exploring coastal areas, harbors, marinas, places like that. Um, and sailboats, we all saw the, the Maiden Factor video, which is lovely. Um, some of my particular favorite participants and the ones that, that tend to donate or contribute the most data are even families that are living aboard their sailboats, traveling the world. Sometimes they'll participate in projects like this for their, their sci uh, students' science curriculum. So it's really exciting to get members um, or participants of all ages involved in this project. So with our connections in the yachting industry and our 25 years of attending you know, boating shows and um, being founded in Monaco, we have grown what we call our Discovery Yacht Fleet to over 200 vessels. So again, this was initially just yachts and we've expanded to sailboats, tenders, um, but this is a, a group that we can call on to help us conduct important marine research. So they can go out and they can collect samples for us for our citizen science projects. They can take science teams on board and maybe take them to places for, for long times that universities or you know, funding is hard to, to come by for those types of expeditions. We also do floating classrooms within our education department. So taking students out on the water and doing um, community engagement. So we'll have vessels participating in things like dive cleanups, taking groups to islands to help remove a lot of the debris that, that gets washed up on these important ecosystems. So that's our Discovery Yacht Fleet. And this is largely who we call upon to take some of these data loggers and just continue their routine operations, but collect this important bathymetric data for us as they travel the world. Um, our mission is research, educate, protect, and restore. So within our Discovery Yacht Fleet, they, those members help us fulfill that mission. So within um, the boating community and crowdsourced bathymetry, we, we kind of expand our network by dock walking at charter shows, at boat shows. Um, we're part of groups like Young Professionals in Yachting. We tend to engage really well with members of the crew that can then pass on information about projects like Seabed 2030 to captains and owners, um, as well as other crew members within their network and, and be able to, to facilitate more um, participants within this project. So we've learned that the more we enter these spaces within the yachting and boating community, the more um, interest we're, we're seeing that these participants have. So it is, you know, as Jen said, the need is there, the boats are there, and the challenge is kind of just getting that information and helping people overcome any of the worries that they might have about participating in a project like this. Um, and Seabed 2030 is also kind of a great gateway to get other science projects going within the boating community. So typically, um, it's a great starting point to get people engaged in these sorts of data collection 
um, projects. And then from there, they often continue on to either host scientists on their, board, on their boats for expeditions or collect samples in other citizen science projects. All right, so now that SeaKeepers is a trusted node, our citizen science team, which consists of myself and our citizen science associate, Valentina, collect the data from our vessels traveling the world and contribute this to the DCDB. Um, so something we're really working on is, is participant engagement. We want to thank and engage those that are, are carrying these loggers. Um, and we do this by creating personalized maps as well as some other things that I'll get into. But this particular map here is one that Brian Calder created for us. Um, this is a really lovely map of one month worth of data from one of our, our vessels, our citizen science vessels. So on this next slide, this is our most recent map that we've created. And this one is also a month um, worth of data. We featured this in our newsletter. We do a vessel spotlight. So someone who has contributed data pretty consistently will get featured in our newsletter. And this was a map from their data that we um, were able to put in our newsletter. So this is off the coast of California, just kind of, you know, their regular operations. It is winter or, you know, fall, so there might be a little bit less travel, but we're working on some different ways of formatting the data to kind of improve the, the feedback and the return that we can give to our participants. So this is just one of the maps we have created and we're working on kind of some different formatting to display this data. All right, so some of the other ways that we try to stay in constant communication with our citizen scientists is by sending out these newsletters every other month that include things like exciting updates um, of vessel spotlight. So, you know, that's always great for, for both the, the yachts or the boats that are getting featured as well as, you know, kind of promoting like, hey, you can be featured and, and show the rest of the boating community the great work that you're doing if you consistently send in your data. Um, and we also have a Facebook group that we recently created to engage our citizen scientists. Um, the goal is to have them meet each other, to be able to ask questions about our citizen science projects, and to propose ideas or solutions to any bumps that they encounter along the way. You know, we can't be out there with everybody recording data, so it's really important that all these citizen scientists can speak to each other and can learn um, if there's any issues or, you know, resolutions to those issues that they can provide each other that we can help assist in. Um, and I, of course, have to thank all of our partners. So we are very grateful to work with Seabed 2030 in this endeavor. Um, we've recently partnered with CID, so Ken Himscoot, um, on these new uh, NEMO 30 wireless loggers that we are really excited to deploy to some of our vessels and that will help with some of the data return. Um, we also have recruited the help of the Bryans, Dr. Brian Calder and Brian Mills from um, University of New Hampshire. They've been incredible data support, so they've kind of taught us how to interpret this data and format it for the DCDB. And then of course, the crowdsourced bathymetry community. So all of you here for intellectual and emotional support as we navigate some of these challenges of crowdsourced bathymetry. So our future in crowdsourced bathymetry is obviously trying to ramp up um, the number of participants and citizen scientists that are collecting bathymetric data. But I think an even bigger goal is to create an engaged citizen science community. We want people to understand the work that they're doing and to be able to share it with others. And so we're really working this coming year to, to grow our engagement within that community and to create a strong force of citizen scientists traveling the world and collecting data and sharing their findings. All right, so, okay, that's it for me, thank you. Thanks, Katie, for a great introduction. Um, so my name is Tim Kearns, as you know, and many of you might associate me with Map the Gaps and Map the Gaps Symposium, but in reality, Map the Gaps as a company is, it's a registered nonprofit charitable tax status in the United States. <clears throat> it's also a volunteer organization. So anyone who contributes <clears throat> works as a volunteer, and most of us have day jobs, and Gloss is my day job. Um, so at the Great Lakes Observing System, which is really nothing to do with oceans, but it's still mapping and it's still managing marine data information. 
Um, it's part of the IUS program, the Integrated Ocean Observing System, administered from NOAA. Um, and I've been there since 2018. <clears throat> so GLOSS has the regional association as part of IUS. It is sort of a binational organization, although it's registered in the United States. It serves both Canadian and American partners. Uh, the Canadian version of IUS, which is called CEUS, doesn't have a regional association in the Great Lakes. So GLOSS is the de facto um, organization that serves Canada as well. And I sit on the executive committee in CEUS. GLOSS itself, we serve a number of different uh, areas. Our three main uh, areas are the Smart Great Lakes Initiative, which is uh, building a connected ecosystem of technology, information, and partners in the Great Lakes, supporting Lakebed 2030, which really doesn't have anything to do with Seabed 2030, but it's a great name. And uh, when um, Northwestern Michigan College came up with it in 2018, it was inspired by Seabed 2030. So, uh, Lakebed 2030 is definitely inspired by Seabed 2030, but no official um, designation or association. Uh, and then Seagull is our other major platform uh, that we, their sort of program area that we support. Seagull is our marine IoT platform that supports all of our other initiatives that we do at GLOSS. And this was a technology platform that we developed through, throughout COVID, which was a challenge to have four development teams across three continents. Um, and never met anyone in person, uh, yet we still built and released it entirely uh, remote. Um, so Seagull is our platform that we use and that supports our entire data pipeline from everything from marine observation data to bathymetry data that we collect and serve or pass on to our partners. Lakebed 2030 is is a regional initiative to fully map the Great Lakes. And the, the challenges that Seabed 2030 and we have as a, as a global community are the same in the Great Lakes. It's 250,000 square kilometers. It's been approximately 8% of high resolution data mapped. So we've got a long way to go to have a comprehensive map. We have the same challenges when I meet people and I say, oh, I'm involved with a program to map the Great Lakes. And they say, really? I'm pretty sure I've seen some bathymetry maps of the Great Lakes. I'm like, no, you really haven't. Not high resolution. It's data soundings that were collected in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. The last time there was a NOAA white ship in the Great Lakes was last summer. Before that, it was in the 1970s. Uh, so there's a problem of not enough data in the Great Lakes. Navigable waterways is a different story, both Office of Coast Survey and Canadian Hydrographic Service um, na uh, survey those areas on a regular basis, but it's all the, the rest of the Great Lakes that are not mapped uh, to high resolution. So that's really the spirit of Lakebed 2030. And that's Gloss's, uh, part of Gloss's leading that program along with partners, Northwestern Michigan College and NOAA. Over the last few years, we've participated in a few things. One was a prioritization study, similar to what Gary mentioned earlier today. Uh, another was doing a data inventory of what exists in high resolution data already in the Great Lakes. And then we started developing some assets to develop awareness and exposure for what needs to happen, including information, uh, um, sort of infographics, as well as a report that was generated in partners with Axe Ocean, Fugro, and Orange Forest Marine, was to how much would it cost? Victor mentioned yesterday, he did the math. We also did the math. How much would it cost and how long would it take to actually map the Great Lakes? And the numbers ranged from seven to 15 years, 135 to $200 million. And so that's our target now. We're looking for $200 million. And the timeline is less critical. It's more about let's get the job done. And a part of that for us at, Gro at Gloss towards this goal of building a great map, um, this, is what, this is what people think they see when they think the Great Lakes are mapped. Uh, part of it was, developing a program that could get the community involved. We call this our hex map. And just so I didn't put the legend on here, um, I should have, but larger, larger hex cells denote the uh, amount of density of data that we have. Smaller hex cells indicate higher density of data. So around the coastline, uh, Army Corps of Engineers, uh, Canadian Hydrographic Service, Environment and Climate Change Canada has done a great job of mapping LIDAR, but in, this, in the larger parts, in the center parts of the lakes, we have very little data, sometimes over 500 meter spacing between data points. Uh, just some examples, and uh, in the interest of time, I'll carry on. We basically broadly categorize it into high density and low density data. We try to use terminology that's familiar with people. Um, it's so resolution and uh, is hard, actually uh, hard to comprehend for some people. So we just go high density, low density. People seem to get that. Low density though data, we further categorized into crowdsource bathymetry. And this was a program uh, that we launched in around 2020 in partnership with Orange Force Marine. Gloss um, 
uh, contract with Orange Forest Marine to develop a data solution on the back of Seagull to collect data, plug and play, and pass it right through to NOAA's DCDB um, in, in an effort to try and increase the rate of Lake Bed 2030 because raising $200 million is a challenge. So the partnership uh, that we developed with Orange First Marine was, as I mentioned, in spirit to develop a plug and play solution <clears throat> and then to try and attract uh, a cadre of uh, volunteer organizations or vessel operators around the region that could collect data uh, passively while they were in transit or um, uh, on their routine operations. Uh, at some point in there, Gloss did become a trusted node of uh, the uh, IHO CSB working group um, so that we could, uh, and it was, a, it was a relatively easy process and an enjoyable one to work with the group uh, so we could pass data in. Um, this is an animation of what our hex map looks like that we use to visualize, to portray the success. And as, as you zoom in, we talked about this the other day, it's a hexagon tessellation. It's very pleasing to the human eye to make it easy for people to understand where we have data, where we don't have data. It's a very Boolean uh, visualization, but it's also meant that in the future, when this is a mobile app on someone's device and they're out collecting data, they can quickly see where do I need to go so I can fill in a hex cell and help contribute to uh, Lakebed 2030. Um, I'm not going to go from left to right, but just on the back end, <laughs> this is our, it's a cloud-based infrastructure. It's fully automated. Um, once the data loggers are installed, it just connects up to the pipeline through uh, both cell and satellite modem, and the data is automatically uploaded and put into the, right through into the cloud, into the DCDB. Uh, if you've got any questions, well, we'll answer some of them today. Um, we've got a great future in front of us, but par part of that is pursuing the crowdsource bathymetry program, as well as raising $200 million, which we're working a variety of different sources. All right, I think that's it for me, Jennifer. Thank you. All right, hello everybody. Um, thank you for having me. This is the first time I've been invited as a, a panelist, so um, that's a, a thrilling thing. Um, I am here on behalf of Crowd the Bay, which is a project under the Center for Ocean Mapping and Innovative Technologies, or COMET, at the University of South Florida in uh, Tampa Bay. And I'm gonna fly through these slides. Hopefully I just give you enough fodder to come find me later because hopefully we can get to um, some of the questions that we have. But um, you have seen this image now a few times, and I do just wanna quickly highlight that um, you know, investing in good graphics and to be part of that storytelling, you know, I think it really highlights, um, you know, that it's a valuable thing. This costs about 4,000 US dollars for a professional scientific illustration company to develop. And we did that in early 2022 and we're getting a ton of mileage out of it. So, um, and, and branding, especially for something when you're trying to mobilize a crowd should not be underestimated. And I think that came up a little bit yesterday. I think Gloss does a fantastic job of this. You know, everything's very appealing and engaging. And so that's, that's part of um, what we're trying to do as well with Crowd the Bay. So quick overview, it is a phased pilot program right now in Tampa Bay with an eye towards a sustained and diverse crowdsourced program in coastal Florida. But I should say that the, the, Crowdsource bathymetry program is almost incidental to our main goal, which is to develop products and resources that help sustain a regional um, CSB program that can be used by others. And so um, we have four kind of main goals with our pilot program, which um, we are hoping to run through 2025 when the first iteration of COMET um, ends. And so, like I said, outreach and support materials really trying to generate some buy-in for those who may be hesitant to invest because as much as CSB is capitalizing on free data, it's not free, not quite. Um, we're, you know, logger agnostic, working with other, as many different of the CSB loggers as we can, um, and also invest in collecting additional data from those loggers since they are on a NMEA network. Um, if vessels have other sensors that are being fed into that network, um, the, a lot of the loggers can grab that information, and this might be more attractive to other regional observing um, programs. So this is a real quick smattering of um, 
nothing necessarily formal, um, although we do have an MOU with Sea Keepers to uh, do some work um, on a CSB project with uh, Ballyhoo Media, which is a company that runs slightly obnoxious um, boats that go back and forth along the beach with big billboards. But hey, they're going back and forth along the beach. And um, if we can detect any change or, or collect more very shallow bathymetry, that's great. Um, I will say a huge shout out to Seacom and Brian Calder for giving us a donation of several loggers to get us started because this is a um, currently underfunded um, project for us, but it is a kind of an open canvas, which is fantastic. Um, another neat thing that we hope to have out by the end of the year is a beta version of an offset measurement app. Um, so if you have done any kind of hydrographic work um, you know that you need to know where your GPS sensor is in relation to your depth sounder. And so this is using um, AR and, and um, some phones have LiDAR in them. So it's using that 3D measurement capability to do that um, as opposed to pulling out a pen and paper and tape measure. Um, and just to highlight a few outreach materials, like I said, our goal is to really help support everyone else that's doing this and work with others to do that well and create products that can be used broadly. Um, so actually recently I um, started working with uh, Noah Meredith Westington um, on a regional CSB guidebook basically. So that is in development and we'll be reaching out to more people. But for now we have this um, Crowd the Bay website with some um, story maps that kind of are again hopefully visually appealing, engaging, minimal text, and um, it's, ever, it's being ever um, revised. So um, also have a frequently asked questions page for, and this is geared towards participants, people we want to recruit to um, use, basically capitalize on their data. Um, we also have a more internal site, so we're working on an install tutorial for the Wibble. Um, if you go visit that site, please know that video is going to be redone. Um, <laughs> but we don't, um, we just haven't had the time quite yet. We have an offset measurement worksheet um, and also an online form of that, that worksheet. So again, just trying to see what is best supporting um, other trusted nodes and, and other people who um, may want to contribute their data. Um, also have a couple flyer versions of these things too, if you're interested. And everything that we're doing, I am more than happy to have folks adapt. That's the goal here. You know, everything is supposed to be open source and, and we would love to see it used by others. So the last thing I'll mention is that we did a couple months ago now hold a stakeholder engagement meeting. So we are very early on in, in our um, development. You know, as Katie mentioned, they have uh, 70 some users we're, we're much smaller than that at, at this point I, I'm hoping that we'll have seven or eight by the end of the year but that's intentional because we are building the program alongside our stakeholders and so um, this this first meeting that we had we had attendees from a diverse set of coastal focused groups private public you know federal state and all of that good stuff there will be a report published um, early next year and at the Gulf of Mexico conference in February of 2024, we will be holding a second uh, stakeholder engagement meeting and opening that up um, more broadly. So um, if you're interested, that's a QR code to get to our newsletter where you can um, keep up with, with our progress. And I very affectionately say this, but our goal is to basically do crowdsource bathymetry for dummies. I think everyone can appreciate a good guidebook, how many people have opened a brand new electronic and thrown the instructions away and just started pressing buttons. Yeah, so we're trying to make it easy, digestible, and, and, and relatively um, quick to take up. So with that, I will turn it over to Sam. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I've been asked to uh, talk a little bit about the IHO's crowdsource bathymetry initiative um, and by extension the IHO's crowdsource bathymetry working group and in, in thinking how I was going to do that so that it was not just a repeat of many slides you've already seen, I thought we'd look at it through the lens of strategy, policy and delivery. 
So starting with strategy at the organizational level, um, I'm sure you've all read the IHO's um, uh, strategic um, uh, uh, strategy, rather, strategic plan, um, 21 to 26. But just in case you haven't, um, there are three goals. Um, and arguably, crowdsource bathymetry speaks to the aims and objectives of all three of those. But certainly it does for goal two and goal three that basically concern themselves with the, the broader collection of data, the sharing of that data, and the promotion of its use for public good. In terms of strategy in the implementation sense, then when it comes to crowdsource bathymetry, we've started to think about how we would um, engage the crowd um, under the, um, the, the aims and objectives um, of the IHO's mandate. Um, I've picked one uh, here, um, one particular angle to illustrate the sort of thinking that we've done, um, but really starting to, and it comes back to the, the notion of communication, storytelling, um, uh, and engaging and understanding your target audience. Here we've decided to, to frame it as digital philanthropy. Moving on to policy. So there's a clear demand signal in the policy land. Um, we've, we've heard many times already about the UN a decade of ocean science for sustainable development. You've got a schematic there on the left. If your eyes are good, or you probably can see it behind me, um, challenge eight, uh, create a digital representation of the oceans. So clear demand signal at the highest level there. But you may be less familiar with the, uh, the UN Early Warnings for All initiative. So I think launched at COP27 by um, Secretary General um, uh, Guterres. Um, and the statement there, the United Nations will spearhead new action to ensure that every person on earth is protected by an early warning systems within five years. It's a massive task and the WMO who have been tasked with implementing this are very clear that they are terrified that the lack of nearshore bathymetry available to do the modeling they need to feed the multi-hazard early warning systems is, is um, uh, going to significantly or potentially significantly hinder um, uh, development of this. So, so again, in the policy world, we have a clear demand signal. But there's also barriers within the policy world, and I won't labor on this because Jen has, has gone through um, the, 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 the possible concerns here, but I would re-emphasize her point. There are solutions to these problems, and we are starting to work through them. For example, just the change in the clarification of the IHO's definition for crowdsource bathymetry, um, uh, making it very clear that this was um, collecting data under routine normal operations, allowed France to legislate to allow crowdsource bathymetry to happen. <coughs> Excuse me. So in terms of crowdsource bathymetry, its relationship to the working group and the IHO crowdsource bathymetry initiative. Um, this is a schematic um, and what I've tried to do here is, um, uh, is to show the, um, on the left hand side, um, and it's really a bit difficult to, oh, there's no text in the boxes, that's why I'm struggling. Um, apologies for the, uh, the error with the slides. But essentially what I'm showing is, on the right hand side of the, um, of the, uh, of the wire diagram, um, you've got the day-to-day the -day work of the crowdsource bathymetry working group. The, the keeping up to date of uh, B12, so standards, the conceptual work that they do. On the left-hand side, you've got the, um, uh, the crowdsource bathymetry initiative, which makes use of all of that. So it's not as clear as I'd hoped it would be, but hopefully it does um, uh, explain the relationship between um, the, the work of the working group, um, but also um, uh, the initiative, which uh, seems to be taking the form of a hub and spoke um, uh, activity. So the initiative in the middle, the, the, the conceptual thought, the thinking, the standardization, and then the spokes on the outside, and this is by no means exhaustive, um, but all of those regional, national um, uh, initiatives that we've already heard three good examples of um, that, that feed off that core of, um, of information. I couldn't talk about delivery um, without referencing um, a key local initiative, uh, which is the, the IHO's collaboration with the, uh, the Yacht Club of Monaco. Um, we heard uh, from Norma this morning um, about uh, how yachts and the yachting community can, can help. There is a ready-baked crowd there, um, and we're super excited um, to have made that, that formal link. Um, and I think speaking to um, the, the representatives from the Yacht Club of Monaco earlier on today, um, we're, we're really starting to have some fairly fundamental conversations that we should have some exciting news um, soon about how that, that crowd can really scale. Um, 
But this was a fairly late addition to my, my presentation. I thought I'd, I'd tackle it head on. We've already heard yesterday and today um, we, that, that we could almost, if we're not very careful, imagine a tension between um, the virtues of uh, mapping those shallow water areas that might yield high impact results if the data could be made available for various activities versus uh, where we could go and what approaches we need to take to really start to tick off significant percentage areas um, uh, of the 75% the still to be mapped. And I would put it to you that there is no conflict there. Um, and we must be very careful not to put, uh, pit one against the other. The reason I say that that's so important um, is that when you're working in the near shore, um, you fundamentally have to work with nations uh, to understand their priorities. And I'm going to give you an example of this in a second. But that awakening of, of in the national consciousness, in the national psyche, will then help you have those conversations that can remove the barriers um, uh, to um, uh, permitting um, of, uh, of research activity. So we really need to, do, to, to, to look at them both together and, and, and it will become a virtuous circle. But hopefully to make this absolutely clear, some of you may have seen this before, um, what we're looking at here is the east coast of Sri Lanka. Um, and the example um, that I'm pulling from, and there is the reference there um, uh, to the original article, um, the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami. Now, one of the things about tsunamis um, is that they are extremely long period waves. And long period waves of this type are significantly affected by nearshore topography as they make landfall. It changes fundamentally the characteristic of that wave as it arrives onshore. And in the case of the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami, as it hit the east coast of Sri Lanka, um, and by the way, the whole east coast of Sri Lanka is a mixture of canyons and ridges, uh, you have two um, uh, population centers, uh, Kalmanay and uh, Ulaville, uh, very close to each other. One had a submarine canyon, uh, just offshore, one had a submarine ridge. As the wave um, uh, energy was focused uh, on the submarine ridge, uh, the, the characteristics, um, uh, the force and the height of the, um, of the inundation um, uh, resulted in 8,500 people dead, whilst only a few miles south uh, where you had a submarine canyon that was far more effective at attenuating that energy, reducing the height of the wave as it made landfall, um, resulted in two dead. So when we come back to thinking about what is the utility of crowdsource bathymetry in these high impact areas? Well, these are also areas that very few um, uh, 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 dedicated survey platforms ever get to go. It's hard for a nation to prioritize these. Um, they're pretty much limited to those with um, uh, commercial traffic. Um, but it's not just the, the yachting community, um, but those other vessels that are going about their normal routine operations. If we can build the network with them uh, through crowdsource bathymetry initiatives, then it will be possible um, to have the data we need in these sorts of areas to do the modeling that we want so that it can feed into initiatives such as that um, uh, early warnings for all initiative. And that's just one example. Uh, there are plenty more um, uh, of where bathymetry, and you don't need me to tell you this, um, has a very real utility um, to knowledge based decision, decision making. But at that, I'll leave it there. And uh, thank you. We are going to go with just 10 minutes of questions. We recognize that we're running over, so we're just going to take up a little bit of your um, of your lunch time. And while I do have questions here, because time is so limited, I would actually really like to offer the floor to all of you first. If you do have questions for any of the panelists or for all of them, please raise your hand. Hi, those were amazing. Uh, Sam, I had a question for you, actually. Uh, you touched on um, early warning systems, disaster reduction, and I know things like the Sendai 
framework are in place. So obviously, near shore topography and submarine characteristics are very important, as you said. Is there a pipeline uh, in the works or in place that will get the data collected from near shore and then get it to the people or the coastal centers who need it the most uh, efficiently? Um, or is that something that still needs to be worked on? Because I often find that people aren't as prepared for events like these, um, whether we don't have the submarine data or not, or we just haven't understood the seismology of the seabed. Um, what, what are your opinions on that? Thank you. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a great question. Um, on the one hand, um, the WMO, who are leading on the early warnings for all initiative, um, have, have kind of focused on what they, they know and what they do well, which is taking um, data, modeling it, forecasting it, and disseminating it. Um, so there's, there's a couple of challenges there already. One is access to the data, and that's something that they openly admit is not necessarily within their domain when it comes to um, uh, marine data. So there is work to be done, and, and I really wouldn't waste any time pretending that it is anything more than that. There, there is work to be done in that space. Um, in terms of the dissemination, um, uh, again, whether you, you look at the Early Warnings for All initiative, whether you look at the UN Ocean Decade in terms of the work on ocean literacy, um, a, a safe ocean, um, uh, whether you look at the SDGs, um, really to answer your question, the fact that there are uh, activities that all speak to how can we more effectively communicate information to the communities that need to hear it and provide the information in the way that they need to digest it tells you everything you need to know about whether we've got that, for, um, that pathway already sewn up. Um, the, the answer is we don't. Um, and there are many examples um, uh, around the world um, of, and, and actually um, uh, off the top of my head, um, the, the recent volcanic eruption in Hawaii um, uh, showed um, uh, that even somewhere like Hawaii, um, with such a uh, well-established um, uh, uh, um, coastal warning system and series of alarms, that because it did something different or wasn't different enough, um, meant that, um, that that really hindered the evacuation and the, the, the loss of property um, and, and life was so so significant in a, in a, in, and if that can happen in the States, you know, crikey, um, you know, what, what could happen in, in other places around the world? So I hope, hopefully that answers your question. So any of you want to kind of respond to that, especially from more of the US natural hazards or Canadian perspective? So I'm, I'm speaking out of my realm of expertise a little bit here, but I, and, I, and again, US perspective, but I know that um, we have researchers at COMET who are working to integrate updated bathymetry into their coastal circulation models. And so you have an academic institution that's doing that. We are working with NOAA, they do fund us, and, and there is always a back and forth there. But at the end of the day, you have an academic institution that is grant funded trying to maintain these models and be on the cutting edge of those things, which may or may not be sustainable, right? So I, I don't know about other places in the world, but I know that, um, you know, at least, and, and again, and that's hyper regional too. So I think that it can be incredibly varied as to how these kind of derivative products from whether it's formal surveys of, of bathymetry or crowdsource are being used beyond just, here's a map of your data. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, well then I am gonna ask a, a question uh, to the panel and we'll start here with, with you three, with more of, again, the regional, um, side of the house that's really focusing on these specific programs. What has surprised you the most about establishing and starting to implement the, your programs, both in terms of successes and challenges? Katie? Um, so I think working particularly with the yachting and boating community for this from a, a nonprofit perspective, 
I've been surprised by the um, level ex of excitement and interest in these types of projects. Um, you know, I think there is a little bit of a, a stigma or a reputation about the yachting community. And I think once you, it all comes down to education. You know, once you present these, the gaps and the data um, and just the information about these types of projects to, uh, you know, privately owned vessels or just mariners completing, you know, routine operations, people are really interested. And I think it all comes down to that educational aspect of, of needing to inform them of the practical applications of crowdsourced bathymetry and that the, you know, while it is sometimes just a plug and play kind of thing and might be easy to forget about, that data that they're recording is really valuable. And, you know, kind of like Sam and Sarah touched on, the, the ultimate goal would be to find end users, so researchers that can look at this data and it's particularly why long-term data is really important to be able to go back and utilize that and, and infer something about the, you know, the changing of our coastal areas or um, new or unexpected hydrological features in the ocean, something like that. Um, and I think the other surprise or I guess challenge on my end is kind of how you have to poke and prod people to return that data which is why we're really excited about new technological innovations that are gonna kind of help us bridge that gap of you know, the initial excitement and then maybe it's a little easy to forget about and to, to send that data in. So those are some things we're working on, but yeah, I guess what I was surprised with. Thanks, Kitty. Um, <clears throat> at loss, I think what surprised, maybe it wasn't a surprise, but it was a bit of a surprise, I guess, that how quickly we were able to roll out the program so we started in 2020 that we had a joint concept. Uh, it was uh, not a particularly rigid um, spec. It was very simple, it was to design, build and deploy a hardware and software solution that would just work. And within the first summer, we had half a dozen vessels. The sec second summer, we doubled it. And we're now in our third, we're just finishing up our third season. We have nearly a dozen vessels. Uh, so. I think for me anyway, as a, as a sort of program manager, uh, I was pleased and surprised at how quickly we were able just to get it out and work. And we did a lot of that during COVID. Um, the, another surprise then was the, the negative side, which we've, Jennifer articulated well earlier, which was it's been harder to scale than I thought it would be, or we thought it would be. Um, there has been some reluctance or reticence to uh, put a tracking device on a boat or, uh, you know, just a, it's a, a communications and a perception issue. And so that's a challenge, uh, whether it's uh, in the Great Lakes or in the global oceans, it's a challenge that we still face and we'll have to work to overcome that. I think um, mine is very similar and, and built off of what Katie and Tim have just said, but um, I think what has surprised me is how much of a social science exercise all of this is. and. I don't know if we have any social science experts or, or uh, professionals in the crowd, but please join the CSB working group, you're needed. Um, and so, and that goes hand in glove with what you were just saying of this perception issue and, um, you know, the, the uh, cognitive dissonance of you have a phone in your pocket all the time that's tracking you, but you're, you're then you don't want to put that, right? And so it's trying to kind of break down those barriers, but, um, and, and kind of similar to that is the don't take the basics for granted. Um, I think that as scientists, we can often just assume people are gonna, just because we tell them we're the authority on something, you know, hey, this is, this is great, you should do this. And that works for some people, but there are others who really want to take it down to the, the building blocks. And then, and, and so it is a time investment sometimes to, to get people on board and, and that's fine. Um, but we just need to recognize that and, and be prepared. Let's go ahead and let Sam take a stab at the question as well, if you want to, from more of a international governmental level. Um, I think and, and in order to, to say something useful, I'll, I'll have to extrapolate out a little bit. But what, what never ceases to surprise me is the, the, the barriers, perceived or real, um, the reluctance even of the scientific community, the, 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 the research community, um, to engage in seabed mapping um, for seabed mapping's sake. 
as, a, as an end in itself. You know, we, we see, we, we, and we've heard articulated so many things that you can do with seabed mapping data. Um, but it always seems to be a subcomponent of, of the, uh, a specific end. And what that means is that, that seabed mapping activities um, are, are quite often and, and historically have been limited to particular places within a particular approach, quite often an afterthought, um, rather than almost taking um, a, a, an infrastructure approach to seabed mapping in the same way that our, um, our colleagues in the global ocean observing system, the broader ocean observing um, community, they, they talk about their, their sensors of, of various different types as networks. Um, and, and that's not just to talk about Argo floats or um, uh, arrays of sensors that are out there. Um, uh, they even talk about the globally operating SOLAS fleet that for years, decades, have been mandated to collect MET information um, as part of that network. So there, there represents an opportunity in there, I, I think, to, to really start to uh, learn a new lexicon ourselves um, as ocean mappers um, and, and to think about uh, our individual activities potentially as part of a global observing seabed mapping or seabed observing network. Um, if we were to do that, and we were to effectively communicate that, um, uh, that, I think that would make a measurable impact um, on those working to win the hearts and minds in the policy arena, open doors to funding, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you, Sam. So that concludes uh, session five for the morning. Tim, what time are you hoping to have everyone back? Okay. Okay. Before you all take off for lunch, returning back here sharply for 115, where we're going to dive into some of the technologies that are um, that are being explored and advanced uh, for crowdsourced bathymetry, I would like to give our panelists a round of applause, please. And they are here all day, so please bring your questions to them. Okay, thank you. Enjoy your lunch.